Okay, let me introduce myself. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, uh, and I'm pleased to host the Forest Connect webinar series. Tonight we're talking about the inter introduction to the identification and ecology of northeastern hardwood forest tree species. So I've made that rather narrow. And um, what we're going to do, hang on just a second. I have a cough and I periodically need to mute my mic so I don't cough in your ears. Um, we're going to, we'll run through this. Um, let me call your attention though because this is a new uh, web conferencing interface for many of you. There are some pretty neat features that we can look at. Um, one of them that I want to first and foremost call your attention to, if you look in the upper left hand corner of your screen, you'll see the file menu. And if you click on the file menu and go to the save as and then select the option for document, you can save a copy of this presentation to your computer. You have the option to save it in a what's called a UCF or a universal communication format or a PDF. So you can save it to either one of those. It's, it's your preference. Um, I encourage you to do that either now or as we're going through because there are going to be several websites that I will post uh, as part of this presentation and uh, it's easier for you just to save a copy of it and then you can go to that, that copy of the file and have access to those websites. So Tim has no sound. Can do other people, other people must have sound. Let's do, let's do a quick sound check. Who has, am I, is my sound coming through? Okay, um, so let's see, Tim, use the audio menu on top bar, plus turn on speakers. Okay, so let's get going. We have about 62 slides. That's more than about, that's exactly 62 slides. We're three minutes into the session and um, it's going to take all of that time. There are several sources uh, that I need to acknowledge, in particular the forestryimages.org. Uh, lots of great pictures there. If you've never visited Forestry Images, you should give it a try and just type and see a picture of a, of a skidder or a forwarder or a Sitka spruce or whatever uh, strikes your fancy. Uh, another great resource is the Silvix Manual. It's published by the uh, USDA Forest Service. If you just do an internet search for Silvix Manual, this will have a lot of the details about all of the species that we're going to be talking about. So people will have questions about um, how frequently um, red maple has a seed crop or how old a red oak tree is when it uh, produces seed or maximizes seed production. Um, that's the place to go to look up that information. There are two different resources for Know Your Trees. This is a Cornell University. Um, 4-H bulletin on Know Your Trees. The, the value of that is that it has a, a pretty nice dichotomous key, and we'll talk about a dichotomous key in a minute. And then finally, um, Dr. Donald Leopold, who's at uh, the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry and was my major professor as well as my dendrology instructor when I was an undergraduate, um, wrote the book Trees of New York, Native and Naturalized. This is a fabulous publication. There's lots of good uh, diagnostic information there for tree identification. It's not a field guide. It's a, it's a, it's a high, super high quality book. So check those out if you're looking for additional resources. Some other learning resources, uh, Virginia Tech and the University of Tennessee at Knoxville both have dendrology websites where you can go and, and gather information if you're trying to key something out. Recognize though that the species, you know, if you've got an oak tree and you're looking in, in uh, UT Knoxville, um, they've got a greater variety of, of oak trees in Tennessee than they have in New Hampshire or Maine or even in New York. So there may be things that are included there that do not exist in your location and vice versa. So then finally, if you want kind of the standard textbook of dendrology, that would be, well, the textbook of dendrology. Uh, that's, uh, last I looked, it was pretty pricey, but it's a, a good uh, technical resource and it, and it is fairly technical in nature. Okay, um, another 
um, option I'll call your attention to is an online tree identification course that I created about a year ago. And I haven't publicized this too much because I've been wanting to just get some people to try it. Um, I've tested it. I've had students test it. I think it works. It's a free course. It's unmoderated which means that you work at your own pace. It's, there's no group activities. And essentially, the, uh, the six different topics occur over the span of, of typically over five weeks. There's five units. Um, you can maybe see it on the screen if you, if you squint or look at numbers two through six on the left-hand panel. You can see how these are broken out. So a lot of the information that's in that presentation is done uh, you know, a more thorough manner than what we're going to be able to go through here. So there's an hour of narration devoted, for example, to maple and birch, and an hour of narration devoted to locust, oak, and ash. We're only going to do 10 species today, and we're going to kind of skim the surface. But this is an option. You see that website there. Uh, if you're interested, send me an email. I'll give you the passcode to get in. There's no cost for doing this. I just ask that if you if you try the course, that you give me some feedback and see how it works, because uh, this is potentially, this, this tool for online teaching is potentially a very good resource. So what I'm hopeful um, you're going to walk away from this uh, webinar with is the following. Uh, three specific learning objectives. One, be able to list uh, the skills that you need to identify trees and some of the features of hardwoods that we focus on when we identify trees. Um, you know, the things that you look at on on hardwood trees are are different perhaps than the kinds of things that you would look at for herbaceous wildflowers or obviously birds. Um, so anyway, so there, there are key things to look at. I want you to be able to understand some of the differences among hardwoods in terms of particular habitats and ecological features. And the way uh, we'll look at those species on the right, those of you familiar with, with these trees will note that um, we're, we're going to start with uh, the shade intolerant species, and we'll move towards the shade tolerant species. So quaking aspen is intolerant of shade. American beech is highly tolerant of shade. Um, so understand some of those. And then finally, be able to name at least two um, of what we'll call the best recognizable features for five different hardwood trees. OK? And there you'll see the species that we're going to work with. So the components of learning, what you need to pay attention to when you're trying to identify trees. First is you have to be able to match a description of a plant or a plant part with a visual recognition of that. And a lot of this is just being able to essentially visualize the jargon or visualize terminology. So if I talk about um, arcuate venation, some of you will know what that is, some of you won't know what that is. That's a, a common pattern. The venation, maybe you don't even understand the venation as the kind of the veins that are in the leaf of the tree, and an arcuate venation is a particular pattern of those veins. So that needs, that needs to create a mental image for you. If you read that in a book or you see that pattern on a leaf, you need to be able to correspond um, what you see and what you read. And this is just, these are just two examples. There are lots of descriptive terms that you need to be able to visualize. Another might be two ranked needles. You need to understand that some features are going to vary more than others. Um, more often than not, in my experience, and some of you have, I know, a lot of experience with tree identification, um, and as we're going through, if, if, I, if I miss something, please share it. If I get it wrong, please share it. If I overlook something, please feel free to share it. Uh, and some of you have been to farther corners of the earth and the country than I have, and you've seen some different things with these trees. So this is a, this is a neat opportunity through the chat pod for uh, people to be able to share some of their experiences. But so what I've experienced is that leaves vary more than bark. Bark varies more than twigs, and twigs are about equal with fruit in the amount of variation that you have. So pretty much if once you've seen a twig in the buds of sugar maple, it's going to be pretty consistent across all sugar maple trees. The leaves of one sugar maple tree may, may vary dramatically from the interior of the crown to the exterior of the crown, from the base of the crown to the top of the crown. So the leaves have a lot of variability, and the leaves are going to change through the seasons, so will the twigs. Um, but leaves will change through the seasons and from one tree to the next, from sun leaves to shade leaves and so forth. So recognize there's variability. There's also 
uh, an opportunity, if you want to think of it that way, uh, to manage what I'll say terminology. And really what I'm trying to do is encourage you not to get bogged down in terminology. There's a horrendous amount, uh, and I've listed um, five words there. Um, that, that are commonly used to describe. These are just descriptions of leaves. So they're different shapes of the leaf, either the margin of the leaf, which is the outer edge of the leaf, or the shape, the physical shape of the leaf. And there are other kinds of terminology terms that are used to describe fruits and flowers and bark and you name it. So, um, and, and, and in some cases in excruciating detail. So the, you can talk about that there are hairs on a leaf, say the underside of a leaf. Well, you might have tomentose, or you might have hirsuate, or you might have, um, I'm forgetting some of these others, but there are different degrees of hairiness. Um, so, and then there are descriptions of those hairs, so you can have capitate hairs. Um, so anyway, you can, you can quickly get bogged down in terminology. Don't do it, all right? Just learn the trees. Start with a, a basic book like the Know Your Trees book from the website. Become comfortable with those, and then as you gain familiarity, you'll be able to uh, start learning some more of those uh, some more of those terms. Learn how to use a dichotomous key, and then what a dichotomous key does is it it, it shows you a couplet. And so, for example, a couplet is our two paired statements, and the specimen that you're looking at would match with either one or the other of the statement. So for example, if we have a pine tree or conifer and we're looking at the needles, we would see if the needles are born, I mean they originate in clusters, so is there a cluster of needles or are the needles singular? So these are this couplet of options needs to be mutually exclusive and if the key is well done then it is mutually exclusive. And it's a, it's a reliable feature, right? And typically when you look at needles on a conifer tree, it's typically pretty straightforward. Either they're clustered or they're not clustered. And so from that, from that, from that couplet in a dichotomous key, it would take you to a ne another question. So if, they're born, if the needles are born in clusters, then the next question might be, does it have um, you know, five needles or less than five needles in a cluster, something like that. Um, and, then, and then essentially it narrows down your options. You work through these um, variety of pairs of couplets and you're able to arrive at uh, an answer or what you think is going to be an answer for your, for your specimen. So we're not going to go through that process of a dichotomous key. We don't have time, but check out that Know Your Trees website and practice with it. It's a great tool. Going through those couplets also helps you uh, focus on the types of features that are most important for identification. Okay, we're going to look at a lot of different features of trees. You can see them listed here. Flowers, fruit, twigs, foliage, bark, the architecture, the habit, habitat, and how shade tolerant they are. Uh, some of them, for example, flowers and fruit may be not very accessible, but they are particularly good as a diagnostic feature. Um, it may be that sometimes, like with fruits, you have um, you have access to the, you can find the fruit, but you don't know which tree it came from. So you have to use some judgment on that. We're going to focus on hardwoods uh, next month. The, the webinar is going to be on conifers. Hardwoods are important because they're they're great for utilization, right? They cover everything from furniture and paper to to food and habitat. Uh, and other things beyond. So being able to identify them is a starting point for management and a starting point for understanding our woods, whether we're interested in the ecology or the management or the utilization or recreation. If we can see it and identify it, it becomes personal to us and we can appreciate it better for what, um, what values it brings to us. All right, so the general features for all these plants that we're going to look at will be foliage, fruit, twigs, bark, and growth form. We'll, we'll, if there's something, if there's not something diagnostic, we're not going to talk about it, just so you know. Um, so let's get started. We'll get started with quaking aspen. Uh, quaking aspen is uh, in the genus Populus, which is why it's often also called poplar or a popple. 
uh, in quaking aspen is specifically Populus tremuloides or trembling aspen or quaking aspen. The two common names are the same. Uh, and as we'll see, they're, they're often um, so just so you know, folks, I'm keeping all of the microphones muted. If I've muted your microphone, don't unmute it because I get, I don't know about all the rest of you, but I get feedback. So if you have, if you have a comment you want to make, just type it into the chat pod, please. Um, so common names are common and they're not standardized. Latin names or the scientific names. Um, are standardized. So Populus tremuloides, you can go anywhere in the world and say Populus tremuloides to a forester or a botanist and they'll have a, a pretty good idea of what you're talking about. Um, so these are the poplars and cottonwoods very generically. It includes quaking and trembling aspen, big tooth aspen, eastern cottonwood is Populus deltoides, so it has a deltoid shaped leaf. And then Balm of Gilead or Balsam Poplar is Populus uh, Balsamifera. These are all um, relatively soft wood. Um, I mean, they're hardwoods in the sense that they're a deciduous uh, broadleaf tree, but they have a so wood that is softer, lighter, of, of lower density than um, most other hardwoods. So if you have, I was going to say, how much? You know, what's, what's a ton of aspen compared to a ton of oak, but they're both a ton. A cord of aspen is going to weigh about half as much, let's say a dry aspen may weigh half as much as a, as a cord of oak or hickory. They're, they're shade intolerant, which is common for early successional species. So succession, of course, is the progression of plant communities through time, or you might start with a disturbed area. Um, and uh, disturbed areas, the plants that dominate those early disturbed areas have to have some mechanism to achieve that dominance. Uh, in the case of aspen, we'll see that there are two different ways they do it. One is by prolific seed production, if it's onto a mineral soil, and also if you cut them, they have this um, functional attribute where they'll sucker from the roots uh, and, and those plants will continue to grow. Here we'll look at um, big tooth aspen in the lower right hand corner in contrast to the foliage of um, quaking aspen. Um, before we get into that foliage, let's first, the, the first thing that I look at when I look at a hardwood tree is what's called leaf arrangement. Um, and leaves come from buds, so this time of year we would be looking at bud arrangement. And what bud arrangement refers to is whether or not the buds are paired or opposing one another on the stem. And sometimes you don't have a leaf, and so, or, or you may have a leaf but no bud. We bounce one forward. So here, here's a good example. Um, here we have a bud, and the, the next bud is not opposed to this bud. So these would be called alt alternate bud arrangement or alternate leaf arrangement. So this bud is going to expand and form the leaf, or some of them may expand and form the flower. The interesting thing, though, is this pattern of alternate arrangement is uh, is characteristic for many species, um, as well as if it's opposite. So knowing, first of all, if it's alternate or opposite, narrows down the field of options very quickly. So that's the first thing I do. All of the aspens, and the genus is going to be consistent. Uh, and typically, I'd have to think about this for a minute, but I think within a family, uh, everything's going to be consistent. So, so aspen is in the willow family, the Salicaceae family. All of the willows and all of the poplars are alternate. That, so there's one, I can think of one example in the dogwood um, genus where that's not the case. But typically it's pretty consistent. With aspen, um, the feature that most easily um, distinguishes big tooth aspen from quaking aspen, you see these sharp protrusions, prominent protrusions on the margin or the edge of the leaf. So the edge of the leaf is called the margin. Those are coarse teeth on big tooth aspen, hence the name. And if you look on quaking aspen, you can see and it's, it's often not this smooth of a margin. There's often, uh, I think it's typically described as a crenate margin, so it's small rounded teeth, which is what, if you look closely at that 
tooth on that, or that leaf margin on that leaf. Uh, looks like so a crenate margin on Populus tremuloides and a uh, coarse toothed margin on Populus grandidentata. How's that for an easy name to remember? Grandidentata. So you're wondering though, why do you call it quaking and trembling aspen? If you look inside the circle, you'll see the petiole of quaking aspen and the petiole. So we're, we're working through some jargon and terminology here, aren't we? Um, the, the petiole is the stalk that connects the blade of the leaf to the twig. And with Populus tremuloides, quaking aspen, as well as big tooth aspen, and I'm pretty sure also with um, eastern cottonwood, and I don't remember, somebody here may remember whether this is true for uh, Balm of Gilead, but that petiole, if you look at it, it's flattened. Do you see how that's flattened? I think you can zoom in on your screens. Feel, feel free if you want to try and zoom in and take a closer look at that. By making it flatten, most petioles are what? They're going to be, most of them are going to be round. And by having it flat, that means it bends easier in one direction than it does in another direction. So it bends easier side to side than it does front to back, for example. That easier bend uh, when it when you it takes just a very gentle breeze, and that's able to um, make that leaf uh, quake or tremble in the wind. Okay, here are the flowers. You see on the left hand side, these flowers, as in most of these species, come out in the spring. Um, the only hardwood woody plant I know that flowers in the fall is uh, witch hazel, um, Hamamelis virginiana. Uh, most things flower in the spring because then it gives presumably the fruit the summer, spring or summer to mature and disperse and germinate and become established or it may require an overwintering cold stratification. So here you see the formation of those flowers. Um, the flowers will, there will be male and female flowers. I don't know if these are all in one flower or not, but there's pollen is produced that uh, pollinates the, um, the female part of the flower, uh, and you'll oftentimes on ponds, I've been out in the spring, and the ponds will be coated with the pollen of, of quaking aspen. The buds, we looked at these earlier when we were talking about imbricate, or when, I'm sorry, when we were talking about alternate buds and alternate, um, alternate versus opposite buds. Here these buds are, have what are called imbricate bud scales. And so the scale is just like the scale on a fish, and imbricate means that they're overlapping as with the, shing the shingles on a roof, or for that matter, I guess, the scales on a fish are typically imbricate. So it's sharp, um, brown, not hairy, and dry. And oftentimes, and I've, and I've mentioned not hairy and dry, um, not because it's particularly diagnostic for quaking aspen, because it separates out big tooth aspen and balm of Gilead. Big tooth aspen will have hairs on it, and balm of Gilead will have a sticky resin. So it's a dry, glabrous, meaning hairless, uh, bud. You can also, uh, we probably won't get into too much of this because it's overwhelming details, but there is, and we'll see this on, on one of the other ones, it's particularly important, and if you take the course, the course gets into some of these details. The leaf scar, so the, the leaf is attached to the twig when that, when that uh, leaf scar breaks away, there's, for many species, there's a characteristic shape and pattern and look to the scar that's left behind following the the abscission of the leaf. For the case of Populus, and this is for all three, or for all of the, for the, for the entire genus Populus, my memory is that there are three individual, what would be called vascular bundle scars. So the vascular tissue is the phloem and the xylem. It's like the blood vein of the tree. And there are three distinct um, vascular bundle scars on those aspen twigs or popple twigs, some people call them popple or aspen or poplar. This is different from um, tulip poplar or yellow poplar, which is in a different genus. That's in the genus Liriodendron. So if you write the word grammatically, yellow poplar, it should be yellow hyphen poplar because it's a not a true poplar or tulip hyphen poplar. Um, quaking all of these aspen trees that we're talking about uh, populace are native to New York, native throughout the Northeast. 
Um, I didn't refresh my memory, but it seems to me that quaking aspen has the greatest, um, uh, what would it be, latitudinal? It's circumpolar, so it goes all the way around the world um, at the northern end of the range. So it's a very common species. Northern species, um, you know, as you get into the lower Midwest and and uh, lower elevations of the mid-Atlantic and southern states, you're not going to find it. You'll find quaking. Uh, I'm sorry, you'll find uh, uh, deltoides, eastern cottonwood. Okay, here we're looking at just some pictures of it in the landscape. It ranges in bark color from white to olive green, and uh, it's it's um, it's not. I don't I don't find it easy to use color to differentiate Populus tremuloides quaking aspen from big tooth aspen. I think there are probably some patterns. I can never remember them. Um, so I'm not going to share those. Some of you may have that as, as something that you're familiar with. Uh, if I was inclined to say something, I would say that the, the whiter species tend to be quaking aspen and the greener species tend to be big tooth aspen, but I'm not certain of that. Uh, I do know that, that, that quaking aspen tends to occur on slightly moister soils and big tooth aspen would be more of an upland drier site species. Both of them will get fairly rugged bark at maturity as they get as they get older. What's interesting, we'll see it again in this next slide, is I mentioned the species has the ability to uh, regenerate um, itself from suckering by the roots. So plants can re reproduce either uh, vegetatively or um, a veg um, sexually or, or vegetatively, sexually or asexually. Uh, and if it's vegetative, then it means it's coming, the plants are coming off the, the original parent growing stock. So it might be a branch that breaks and sticks in the mud and forms roots, which aspen and willow can do. It might be that you cut it and it sprouts from the stump. It might be that, it, that you cut it and it sprouts from the roots. Aspen, or the, the Populus tremuloides and Populus uh, granda dentata will both root sucker, as will Balm of Gilead. I don't think cot eastern cottonwood does that, but somebody can correct me if I'm if I've mistaken on that. So what you can look at in this, for example, in the, this upper picture, uh, I've heard reports that that the lar largest organisms, maybe it's the weightiest organism in the world, is a clone of quaking aspen because you can have a single plant that reproduces itself through the root system and it's genetically identical. And so this is great if you have um, a plant that's growing on the right soil, right? It's taking it, it's, it's surviving, it's in this environment and everything's going really well for it. But it's, it's not so good if you have uh, things like hypoxylon canker or forest tent caterpillars because if you have one caterp if you have a, a plant that is um, uh, susceptible to one insect or type of fungus, then that entire clone is also going to be susceptible. So let's look at start with the best rec recognizable features. The key things for this particular species, well for the genus, we have a flattened petiole and we have uh, three vascular bundle scars. I didn't put that on there, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. For the species, so what separates quaking aspen from big tooth aspen is it has a glabrous dry bud and small teeth on the leaf margin. All of them tend to be intolerant of shade, so they're not going to reproduce themselves without a major disturbance. If you're a grouse hunter and you want young, young aspen as uh, to produce the, the seeds and fruits and, and flower buds for the grouse to eat or for the grouse to perch in, you need a large disturbance, a fairly intensive disturbance. It doesn't have to be 30 acres, it might be an acre or uh, two-thirds of an acre or four, four acres, which you need pretty good size and fairly um, complete disturbance in order to regenerate aspen. It has a lot of different uses, uh, both for human uses as well as wildlife. If you're going to regenerate by seed, it needs mineral soil. It is fast growing, um, and like most of these species that grow fast, they die fast, although not entirely. 
Um, Lou raises a point. Lou, if you want, be sure to send things to everybody. Um, he mentions that it's uh, big tooth aspen is an excellent structural timber as long as it's kept dry. Very good point. I mentioned that at lunch. I forgot to mention it here. Um, I know of people that have built um, barns and uh, other uh, structures out of it. It is not what you want to have exposed to moisture or soil. So keep it dry, keep it away from the dirt, and I've heard that it does pretty well. Okay, jumping right along. And uh, I'll just point out here that we've covered one of 10 species and we're halfway through. So I'm gonna try to talk faster and uh, I'll, I'll do my best, but uh, it, it may well be that we end up having um, running over the time frame. I, I, I'll apologize for that in advance. Paper birch is in the genus Betula. Uh, the family is Betulaceae. Uh, the, the species name is Papyrifera, or paper birch, or white birch. Uh, the other four birches that you might see in the eastern U.S., uh, sweet birch, or black birch, are Betula uh, Betula lenta, yellow birch is Betula alleghaniensis, previously Betula lutea, gray birch is oh, Poplifolia. Man, I should have reviewed these. Most of these I don't see very much. So then river birch is Nigra, I think. People can correct me if I've gotten those wrong. And the same family is eastern hop hornbeam in the genus Australia, American hornbeam in the genus Carpinus, and hazelnut in the genus um, Coralus. So um, one of the features, so this also, let's, we'll look at this twig. You can see that this is, has alternate leaf arrangement. Now, when you look at it closely, you'll see, it may look like you've got a pair of leaves there, um, but, but typically what you're seeing is just um, a branch that hasn't expanded all the way. So the base feature here are these structures. So these, this is an alternate leaf arrangement. The real key though, and this is for the family, is what's called a doubly serrate leaf margin. You see that in the left on a hop hornbeam leaf, and you see it in the close-up on the right on Betula papyrifera. Uh, doubly serrate means that the ser it's serrate, which has a pointed tooth. Doubly serrate means that it has a small and a large tooth. So small and large tooth. Uh, that's characteristic for the entire family. So if you find that doubly serrate, you know that you have something in the birch family. You haven't narrowed it down much beyond that. There are some other features in the, the online course that I have goes into more of these details. What I just point out to you here is that notice that that the visualization of the of the description of doubly serrate on the left is different than the visualization of the doubly serrate on the right. So they're not always going to look the same. You sometimes have to use a little bit of imagination. The the leaf on um, the base of the leaf on paper birch tends to be fairly broad and blunt. Uh, some of the other ones tend to have more incurving, or uh, as I recall, river birch. I haven't seen river birch in 20 years. Is um, it's an angled base, so this is kind of a broad, rounded base. The bark of paper birch is what I think most of you have probably seen, if not in real life, then in pictures. It's the peeling white white bark. Yellow birch will also have a peely, flaky bark. Uh, black birch does not. Um, it has uh, kind of plates that will, that will roughly curl, but it doesn't have the papery texture and feel that paper birch does or yellow birch does. And you can see that it can look quite different. This doesn't develop until the tree has some maturity to it as a young stem, two inches or three inches in diameter. It's going to be brown and shiny. And it will have, you can see in the white bark, you see these little cross hatches. Those are remnants of lenticels. Lenticels, as I understand it, are um, involved in gas exchange through the stem. I don't, don't quote me on that. That's uh, from way back. Um, but it's diagnostic of, of some of these species. The birches have it and cherry has it as well. Uh, yellow birch is going to have a bark that looks similar to this. On this size tree, these would be, uh, let's say, 8 to 14 inch trees. Yellow birch would have similar kinds of bark, but it would be more of a yellowish or bronzish look. Okay, here we have a, a patch of paper birch. Um, 
on the left. Uh, paper birch is also is an early successional shade intolerant species. It's going to establish following clear cuts or abandoned agricultural lands or wind throws. Uh, it's a beautiful tree when you have these clumps, uh, big clumps of white paper birch. Um, it's, it's a really a spectacular site. Uh, we have some on our property. Um, my wife very much likes paper birch, um, and so we've gone out of our way to try to manage for paper birch. Um, I made a mistake once not communicating clearly, and we were talking about how much we liked paper birch, and um, I liked it stacked in the firewood pile. She liked it standing. Um, that uh, got to a bit of a complication, but we've gotten beyond that, and I've been regenerating paper birch ever since. So another neat feature, though, of paper birch and the birches is that um, it, will, it will form what's called stilted roots. So the, the root, the seed, will land on an organic structure, such as a stump or a, um, a log, and it will germinate, and then the, the roots will grow around that stump or log, and uh, eventually the stump or log will rot away and leave perched or stilted paper birch, yellow birch, black birch. I've seen hemlock do it. So all of those are possible um, species that will form those stilted roots. It's just kind of cool to see in the woods. Uh, grows fast, lives fast, dies fast and easy, dies young. You know, a 70 or 80 year old paper birch tree is a very old tree. Once the crown starts to, canopy starts to close around it, it's intolerant of shade. It's hard to keep it in the uh, in the canopy. Here's a, a shot. This was an area, I think the, the description of this particular picture was, um, uh, that this, these trees have been defoliated by gypsy moth. Um, you'll also see areas where uh, paper birch once formed these magnificent expanses following them. If you see a big patch of paper birch, that means at some point in the past there was a great big disturbance there. Um, and then eventually they die and whatever's underneath them will grow into become the next forest. That's why it's important to know what's in the understory. So the best recognizable feature um, is going to be the white exfoliating bark. There are some other features we talked about, um, the lenticels and the doubly serrate leaf margins and the shape of the base of the leaf margin are going to be helpful, but they're not going to separate out a paper birch. Uh, one thing, paper birch and gray birch and river birch don't have a smell. When you scratch the twig, there is no smell. Black birch and yellow birch, when you scratch the twig, have a wintergreen smell. Similarly, you can chew on it and have a wintergreen flavor. So, all right, moving forward still, we have our next species is black cherry. The genus Prunus is the, is the cherry genus. So the, all of the cherries are going to be characterized. Similarly, um, in this genus, Serotina is the species. Uh, you can see that the leaves are arranged in an alternate pattern. So I hope you're getting the sense now when we look at hardwoods in particular, the first thing we're going to look at is whether or not those leaves are alternate or opposite, or the buds are alternate or opposite. Um, black cherry uh, and cherries are in the rose family that also includes the apple group. I mean, there's lots of apples, lots of plums, and different kinds of roses. In the genus, we have black cherry. Some people call it wild black cherry to distinguish it from um, uh, the fruit, from the um, d domestic horticultural varieties of cherry that produce the, the uh, sweet cherries or tart cherries, pie cherries. We also have fire or pin cherry is Prunus pensylvanica. We have sweet mazard cherry or bird cherry is Prunus avium and choke cherry which is a clonal shrub, is Prunus virginiana. So two features to look at. A genus feature, characteristic of the genus, at the base of the leaf where it connects to the petiole, you will see on all species in the genus, genus Prunus, at least all of the naturally occurring ones. I don't, I, I'm not familiar with um, horticultural varieties, but I suspect that Lou Ward could probably help me here. But I'm uh, assuming everything in the prunus genus is going to have a pair of glands uh, at the at the juncture of the leaf blade with the petiole. 
And if you zoom in you can look inside that circle, I think you can probably see that. Um, now these glands are nothing more than a raised bump and there's going to be a pair of them. They may be offset a little bit, but at the base of every leaf there's going to be that. And, that, and then you know that it's in the genus Prunus. The other thing for genus Prunus, when you scratch the twig and smell it, you're going to get the aroma of a bitter almond smell. And what you're smelling is hydrogen cyanide. Um, you can chew on it. I wouldn't eat a lot, but chew on it on the twig and you can get a, a, a mild flavor of that. What's one thing that's, um, so the, the margin of, I'm thinking all of the cherries have a fairly standard leaf margin that would be described as um, maybe a wavy crenate or wavy uh, serrate. So small teeth and slightly wavy um, undulations. Excuse me. What's, what's particular to black cherry is um, uh, hairs that form along the midrib on the lower side of the leaf. So you look at the lower side of the leaf, the upper side of the leaf is dark green. And the way one of the ways that you can tell the cherries is by the general shape of the leaf and the stoutness of the twig. The stoutness of twig is, is a relative term. Some of these things that we look at on, on plants are relative. And until you, meaning that it's, it has to be in the context of the others that are like it. So I can tell you that the, the twig diameter of black cherry tends to be intermediate between pin cherry, which has a, a more delicate, smaller diameter twig, and this would be New Year's or first year's growth, current year's growth, versus um, sweet mazard cherry, which has a more uh, robust twig. So until you see those side by side, though, it doesn't really do you much good. So we're going to try to focus on things that are a little more um, a little more discreet. One of those things that's very diagnostic for black cherry is the presence of uh, what's called a pubescence or hairs and these hairs by the middle of the summer are orange at the beginning of the summer they're whitish but if you have these hairs on the lower midrib of, of, a, of a leaf and it's a cherry then you're sure that it's a black cherry. I have seen black cherry that I'm certain are black cherry that lack that those hairs along the midrib. So the presence is a positive confirmation the absence doesn't mean that it's not black cherry. Here we're looking at black cherry mixed in uh, the forest. Uh, this is a close-up um, probably of the picture we see over here. We have black cherry. It's standing next to a red oak, standing next to a striped maple, standing next to a sugar maple, and that's all that I can identify. So black cherry f has a fairly frequent seed crop, um, and the seeds will germinate in litter, leaf litter as you see on the forest floor in the pictures. But because the plant is intolerant of shade, these will not last very long. So if you, you may have a bumper crop of, of black cherry and the seeds will become established, but unless there's adequate sunlight, which is a fairly large amount of sunlight, those seedlings are not going to survive. They'll, they'll last for a year or two uh, and then die. Here's the bark of black cherry, uh, described as burnt potato chip bark. Um, they're kind of plates, maybe the size of poker chips or a little bit bigger, and about the thickness of a paper plate. Here's the twig. Um, the, the, it looks in some respects similar to the uh, uh, Quaked Aspen we saw earlier. Alternate, uh, alternate bud arrangement has imbricate bud scales. This would not have three vascular um, uh, scars within the leaf scar, uh, and uh, but this also has the aroma of of burnt almond or hydrogen cyanide. It's it's important to pause for that for a minute. The foliage on on cherry is fine if it's fresh, and by fresh I mean uh, a deer or a horse would pick it off the plant and eat it. What's not fine, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that because you don't really know, you don't have much control over that, but in theory, as long as it's entirely fresh, it's fine. There's hugely significant problems 
if you cut the branches or a branch breaks off a tree and lands in a pasture and that foliage starts to wilt and a horse or a goat or a cow eats it, it drops over dead. A very small quantity, I am told, of, of wilting black cherry foliage can kill livestock. So uh, it's, I think, typically recommended that you keep uh, cherry trees away from the edges of, of livestock pastures. Uh, once it's completely dry and dead, it apparently is no longer problematic. But as it's wilting, it's, it's releasing hydrogen cyanide. This is also the reason why there's the, uh, and I'll, I'll call it a, a fable or a myth, um, but at least it makes a reasonable story about you know Boy Scout camp and the Boy Scouts cut some black cherry twigs to roast hot dogs and they're roasting the hot dogs and you have the heat and you have the wilting so the hot dogs absorb uh, the hydrogen cyanide, the Boy Scouts eat them and they get sick. The story doesn't end with anybody getting uh, injured but a lot of very upset stomachs and a trip to the emergency room to make sure everybody's okay. So. You have to pay attention. This is another good reason why you need to be able to identify your trees. Um, oftentimes, at least in our family, we're, we're cutting hot dog sticks or marshmallow sticks in the dark. So what we've trained our daughters to do is to, when they cut the stick, is they sniff it and they look for the smell. If there's no smell of burnt almond, then it's okay to use as a hot dog stick or a marshmallow stick. The fruit is on the left, can get to be pretty good sized. On the right, what you see is a, uh, most of you would look at that and say it's a clear cut. Uh, for those of you familiar with forestry applications or harvests, this would be a seed tree harvest. It's an even age system, as is a clear cut, but it leaves behind widely scattered trees to produce seed uh, in, an, in an abundance of sunlight, remember, uh, black cherry is very intolerant of shade. If you want to grow more black cherry, it needs to have essentially full sunlight. So the trees are remaining to produce seed, uh, produce a little bit of modest cover and, and um, amelioration of the site, and the rest of it is sunlight. And then you can also see these strands of high tensile wire fence to exclude the deer. Okay, best recognizable features. Well, let's start with the, uh, at the genus level, we have the paired glands on the petiole and the bitter almond taste and smell. Um, on black cherry, uh, it tends to have a, a more, on the smaller trees, can have more of a blackish, darker bark. Uh, pin cherry or fire cherry, uh, some people call it, I think, red cherry, has kind of a reddish, cinnamon red, reddish cast to the bark of the smaller trees. Never gets as big as a black cherry will get. Uh, black cherry is uh, best identified in a, in a quantitative sense by the presence of a reddish pubescence on the lower midrib, so reddish hairs on the lower uh, underneath side of the main vein of the leaf. All right, now we're about in the middle of our shade tolerance curve. So we're getting some species that can grow for a few years in a shaded understory. These, this includes the genus, the ash genus, which is Fraxinus. Uh, white ash or American ash is Fraxinus americana. Green ash is Fraxinus pennsylvanica. Black ash is Fraxinus nigra. And blue ash is Fraxinus quadrangulata. All of these have opposite leaves and opposite buds. Let's look at this. Um, if you look, uh, probably right here is the easiest place to see it. You have uh, prominently displayed a bud and a leaf scar, and then you can look and kind of imagine on the other side there's another bud and leaf scar. Here you can see a bud on one side and a bud on the other side. So they're paired, they're opposite one another. What you're seeing in the picture, this pair and this pair are leaflets. So a leaflet is not an entire leaf. You know you have an entire leaf when there is a bud at the base of the leaf. So if you were to zoom in and look at that leaflet, it would be a leaflet and uh, the stalk that connects the leaflet to the central stem in a compound leaf is called a rachis, R-A-C-H-I-S, rachis. Uh, there is no bud there. It's just the stalk that connects the leaflet to the rachis. Um, so this is a compound leaf, and the arrangement of the compound leaf is opposite. Uh, you can have some alternate compound leaves, as in the hickories, 
and the walnuts and tree of heaven and others. Uh, but for us, what we can remember that will help us is that the maples, M for maple, A for ash, D for dogwood, all all have opposite leaves. So if it's a tree and it's opposite, uh, pretty good odds are maple, ash, dogwood. It's not absolute. There are some non-natives that don't fit this pattern, but for all the native species in your woodlot, uh, this is a pretty good bet. You can have some like buckthorn that are sub-opposite, and I guess we'll just leave it at that. So characteristics of white ash, we've already talked about it being um, opposite. The buds, remember some of the buds we've looked at have imbricate bud scales. This has a, a velvety, fuzzy bud cap. So it's not an obvious scale or certainly not imbricate scales. The best way for me to differentiate white ash from green ash is, is based on the shape of the upper edge of the leaf scar. So this is the leaf scar, this light colored structure here. That's the bud, so that kind of chocolatey brown blob that's above this shield shaped light colored patch. On white ash, the, there's a V shaped notch in that leaf scar. Uh, on green ash, that leaf scar is flat across the top and then the bud rests directly above it. So, and this is, I find this easiest to differentiate either on uh, the previous year's growth or, or in August or September when the, when the leaves have started to, to senesce. But typically the previous years, the second growth, uh, second year old twigs are going to show this best. There are features of the, of the Samara, and the Samara is the type of fruit that we have in, in the ash as well as in um, maples. It's essentially a winged seed, and in white ash, the wing will will have the 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 blade of the wing will extend about a third of the way uh, up the seed. In green ash, it's uh, usually just covers the tip or a quarter of that seed. Let me jump back to the foliage on on white ash. In the foliage on white and green ash, I find particularly challenging and inconsistent. The textbooks will tell you that that white ash has a burgundy fall color and green ash has a yellow fall color. And uh, white ash has serrations on the distal or outermost half of the leaf margin, whereas green ash would have serrations starting from the from the base of the leaflet all along that margin. So um, in terms of bark, here's a picture of bark. Uh, I've had people tell me they can differentiate green and, and white based on bark. Um, I don't believe them. Um, maybe they can. I certainly can. I've never been able to see any kind of pattern in that. Uh, the other way that I can differentiate white and green is based on habitat. So you have a, a fairly fertile upland soil, not a, necessarily a dry site, although it could be a drier site. You'll find white ash down in uh, clay soils. Wetter sites is going to be uh, stream sites is going to be green ash. Swampy sites is going to be black ash. Uh, blue ash is a Midwestern, uh, maybe Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois kind of species on uh, drier uh, limestone outcrops. Uh, all ash trees, and I think that's my next slide, Tom, um, all of these in the genus Fraxinus are susceptible to emerald ash borer. If you haven't heard of emerald ash borer, this is a bad, bad bug, and uh, it's actually a badbug.something website, badbug.com or info, uh, or just go straight to emeraldashborer.info. Uh, this is going to be a huge problem for ash in the eastern forests. So and we've had webinars on this in the past. We'll have one, I'm sure, in the next few months, so I won't spend any more time on this. Uh, white ash, best recognizable features. Opposite compound leaves are characteristic of the genus. The velvety bud scales, characteristic of the genus. 
V-shaped uh, notch on the leaf scar is characteristic of the species, as is the outer margin of the leaf being seri in the wing covering about a third of the seed. It's tolerant as a seedling, becoming increasingly intolerant through time. It's dioecious, meaning that it has two houses for the flowers, which is kind of neat. Um, and it's particularly neat if you have a single ash tree in your yard, and there's no other ash tree around, you're not going to have any ash seeds. It's either going to be a male tree or it's a female tree. Um, and as you well know, uh, and, and it's, it's not reproducing, it doesn't, it'll, it'll stump sprout, so it'll vegetatively reproduce that way. But, you know, if you only have a male or a female, there's no other reproduction that happens. So um, usually very decent form, has very high volume, can have very high volume per acre. And again, EAB is a, is a big bad deal. Oaks are a great um, genus, Quercus, um, Quercus rubra in the Fagaceae family that also includes uh, beech and I believe American chestnut. There are uh, two subgenera of oak. There's the red oak subgenus and the white oak subgenus, and we'll look at those separately and focus in on the named uh, species of that subgenus, which in this case is northern red oak. The subgenus is characterized by a few features, including bristle tips, so a sharp uh, hair-like tip on the end of the lobe. All of the oaks, all the northern oaks, have fairly prominent um, lobes and sinuses. So that's the terminology. The sinus is the, is the carved out piece, and the lobe is the projection. So the suboak genus, which includes the species northern red oak, which is rubra, black oak, black oak is uh, Quercus felutina, pin oak is plustris, scarlet oak is coccinia, and schumard oak is schumardii, um, have bristle tips, dark colored bark. The acorn meat is described as more bitter than white oak acorn meat, which if you've eaten white oak acorns, raw, then you can hardly imagine that there's something worse than that. The xylem is porous, and I'll mention this again in reference to uh, white oak when we're talking about white oak. The buds are sharp pointed um, for the subgenus, and all the oaks have a stellate pith. So if, if you cut the twig in cross section, uh, doing it particularly without um, smashing it, maybe you put it at a slight angle. The pith is that spongy part in the center that you don't like to get to when you're cutting a hot dog stick. The pith is star-shaped, so and you got to use some imagination, right? This is not a star like you find on a Christmas card star. This is kind of a, a, a squiggly, amorphic thing that has usually five points on it. But again, you need some imagination. Here's the buds and fruit of northern red oak, Quercus rubra. Pointed buds, again, characteristic of all of the oaks. Uh, red oak is characteristic of, characterized by having kind of a reddish brown, uh, maybe barely angled, but more typically described as round in cross section. Black oak tends to have kind of a four or five sides, almost a pyramidal shape to the buds. Uh, stout, glabrous twigs, kind of a normal description for a twig. The acorns on the oaks, if you're really good with your oaks, um, and I used to be better when I grew up in Indiana and we had dendro, and we had to identify 13 different species of oaks. So at one point I was really good with oaks. I've, I've lost a lot of that because uh, New York doesn't have most of those oaks, so they're few and far between. But you can differentiate the oaks by the shape and size of the acorn and by the, the pattern, the texture of the cap, and by the depth of the cap. So the acorns, if you're good at it, the acorns will give you pretty much all you need to know. So, so northern red oak has a shallow cap. I think of it as a beret and uh, tends to be fairly smooth. Other, other caps will be knotty, I'm sorry, knobby or warty or fringed along the edges. Here's the bark on a younger tree. It's 8 o'clock. i got to talk really fast. Um, as that younger tree matures, so you can see this bark is starting to break up, and you have plates or flat areas between these fissures. As those develop in maturity, you still have the fissures, and the plates remain broad and flat. 
and you can see it well on this stem. And it's often the case where you can look up into the into the stem of the tree and find a section that might be oh, 12 to 16 inches in diameter, and you have these broad, flat, almost looks like ski tracks coming down a fresh um, uh, a hill freshly covered in snow. So broad, flat ski tracks. Black oak doesn't look like that. None of the other red oaks look like that. All the red oaks have a dark bark. If you bore into the, into the fissure and get into the, the cambium just inside the bark on red oak, it's kind of a peach color. And that differentiates it from black oak, which has a yellowish uh, and bitter tasting inner bark. So bristle tips characterize the subgenus. Uh, the, the species Quercus ruber, northern red oak, is characterized by a shallow acorn cap, ski tracks in the bark I just mentioned, and uh, peach colored inner bark. The stem will self prune, meaning that the lower branches, if it's growing in the shade, those lower branches will die and fall off. Black oak and scarlet oak and schumard oak and pin oak, uh, those lower branches will die, but they'll usually be retained. They don't self prune. Uh, tends to be intermediate in, in tolerance. Uh, best growth is going to be in relatively full sun. The neat thing is that the fruit require two years for maturity. So you'll see one year, you'll go out and you'll see, oh, we've got an acorn crop forming on our oak trees, and it may allow you to do some planting. So, because you know that you have another year before those seeds are actually dispersed. White oak will do this uh, by contrast, has rounded lobes. Uh, for the subgenus, which includes white oak and chestnut oak and swamp white oak and bur oak, tends to have an ashy gray bark. The meat is described as sweet. Uh, I ate some um, some chestnut oak um, acorn meat once and found it. Uh, I think astringent is the word. It was like my cheeks were being sucked forward um, past my teeth. It was it was a uh, a noteworthy experience. Everybody should probably do it once. Um, but don't do very much of it. So, and again, the, the pith is stellate in cross section. Here's the bark um, of chestnut oak. Tends to grow to be very rugged, coarsely textured. The, the the sinuses are quite shallow. It looks a lot like a chestnut leaf, but with rounded lobes. Swamp white oak, a Quercus bicolor, is distinguished by having a very long peduncle, which is the stalk that connects the the stalk that connects the uh, the fruit to the twig uh, can be up to two inches for swamp white oak. The other feature with swamp white oak is it has this exfoliating bark. So swamp white and, and these spe species will differentiate in habitats. So swamp white oak is a uh, is a swamp white oak. Let me click on the right picture. Is a wet site species. It doesn't have to be in a swamp. I've seen it growing on just moist, fertile soils that don't dry out. Versus chestnut oak, which is Quercus prinus. Um, I learned it as Quercus prinus. I think more recently the name's been changed to Quercus montana. Uh, always on dry sites. You aren't going to find that on a wet site. Uh, white oak Quercus alba, you can see the, the lobes here tend to be fairly deep but irregular. The acorn cap covers about a third, uh, quite an oblong, uh, elongated nut, and the, the nut cap covers about a third of that acorn. All the oaks were pounded in the 80s and 90s by forest, I'm sorry, by uh, gypsy moth, which you see in the picture. And I heard a report just last week that um, based on um, uh, surveys for egg masses of gypsy moth, there are some places in New York they're expecting some outbreaks of gypsy moth this spring. So keep your eyes open. Here's the bark of white oak. Um, variable gray uh, ranges from very platy and elongated plates that are almost shaggy to coarse uh, blocky textured alligator kinds of bark. So you can, what I'm trying to do with this picture is show you the variety of different um, characteristics of bark on white oak. Um, I've heard it described as having the most variability in bark of any one tree. It can look at, look at, look in one fashion at the bottom. Bark will often look different as you go up the tree because up the tree is a younger part of the tree, but you get uh, an accelerated variation with white oak. And uh, you, you'll get also a great deal of variation between species. 
excuse me. Here's a big white oak on our property, six feet in diameter. Um, grew up in an old pasture. There's a beautiful tree, great big massive spreading crown. Okay, Quercus alba, rounded lobes, characteristic of the subgenus. Uh, the species alba has an oblong uh, acorn with a coarse deep cap. Deep is about a third. It's relatively sweet, according to some people. Acorn meat, ashy gray, highly variable bark, tends to be on drier sites. So the, the, the xylem, we talked about open xylem on red oak and the xylem on white oak. Uh, the xylem are, think of them as drinking straws, and those drinking straws um, don't really come end to end with xylem cells. Uh, the xylem is what carries the water from the roots up to the foliage. The phloem carries the food from the foliage down to the roots. So on the xylem of white oak, when that xylem is, no, is old and it's no longer used, the pores that allow the connection from one xylem cell or from one straw to the next will plug with a structure that's called a tylose. The tylose, I can't tell you anything more about tyloses than that, than that they plug the pores on the xylem. In a practical sense, it does two things. One, white oak are used for wine barrels, not red oak, because those tyloses um, reduce that there's enough porosity in the wood of oak. If you have oak cabinets or seen oak boards, you can look at the end of it, you know there's very large vessels. And I'm guessing that somebody once made a wine barrel out of red oak and it uh, leaked, and it didn't leak with white oak. So there may be more to that than I'm aware of. There may be more um, secondary compounds in the wood of red oak to give flavor that people don't like in wine. The other thing with tyloses is it restricts the, the spread of, of fungal hyphae uh, that are trying to grow in those cells. So the cells that tannins, yes, thank you, Chris. Um, Tannins are the chemicals that, that you, would, you would find extracted from the wood. And, and that's what you're tasting, the bitterness that you taste in the fruit. The, uh, the tyloses will slow the spread of the fungal hyphae. So that's why white oak is usually considered a more rot-resistant wood than red oak is. OK, the maples. Uh, there's a lot of maples, very common in the northeast and eastern US. We have in New York, uh, and this is probably, uh, it's going to be pretty much the same for the eastern U.S. I'm not, if somebody knows of some other maples, let me know, tree species maples. So we have the, the what are called the soft maples, are maples whose fruits will ripen, let me think about this, well, that's not true. Uh, so red and silver have fruit that ripen in the spring. Box elder is a soft textured, soft, low density wood uh, tree that grows commonly on bottomlands and stream bottoms. It's a great species in that location, grows fast, um, but it's fairly brittle wood. And uh, But it, I'm pretty sure that fruit ripens in the fall. Uh, typically, the, the differentiation between soft maples and hard maples is the soft maples ripen in the spring. The hard maples, which are sugar and black, or the fruit ripens in the fall. Then we have subcanopy maples, striped maple and mountain maple that we're not really going to talk about. I'll show a picture of striped maple. Uh, those are, are uh, interesting subcanopy species. Striped maple can be very common and is uh, can also become a problem because of its, uh, it's not browsed by deer. It's very tolerant of shade. It reproduces at a very young age and uh, you can inform dense understories of striped maple. There's some other genera, uh, particularly viburnum, which is a shrub, and platinus, which is the sycamore genus. Uh, you can have, there's a native species of viburnum called viburnum acer effolium. Uh, so that's, acer is the genus name for maple, and folium would be Latin for foliage. Acer effolium would be maple-like foliage. Platinus acer effolium is a non-native tree that's sometimes planted. Um, so it's uh, maple, I, I forget the common name of that. So these are all, op the, the genus Acer is all opposite, uh, and they all have simple leaves, but they're not compound leaves except for box elder, which has compound leaves, Acer negundo. So key features to identify red maple, and this is, this is the one, if there's one pair that stumps everybody, it's red versus sugar. So I, I'm here to give you the secrets. 
So the secret for identifying red maple is the margin of the leaf. Remember the margin is the edge of the leaf is serrate. So you see all these little teeth and it's a different look to serrate. We've seen serrate leaves on cherry. We've seen serrate leaves on uh, birch, betula, we've seen serrate leaves, they're doubly serrate, in that case on hop hornbeam. This has a different look to serrate, so we have to visualize these descriptions. It's serrate on the margins and the sinus is an acute angle. So the, 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 it's, it's first of all at an angle, right? It's not rounded, that we'll see in just a minute. It's at an angle and that angle is less than 90 degrees. So that's red maple. Here we see striped maple, also called goosefoot's maple, because the shape of that, um, I, I have a drawing tool I could draw with that, couldn't I? So the shape of that, wow, look at that, is kind of a goosefoot shape. Here's the bud. The bud on, um, on red maple is red on a red twig, and it's a blunt, rounded bud. Uh, and for those of you that know your trees, you'll know that this is a red maple bud against a sugar maple stem. Here's another red maple bud silhouette. Now, the, the red maple will form very large, uh, and silver maple is even more pronounced, uh, flower buds. And in the spring, usually in mid-March, those buds start to get bigger, and you'll see them silhouetted. They look like almost clusters of some growth on the ends of the twigs. Those are the flower buds that are preparing to um, uh, preparing to burst. Here's the bark. The other feature that show so one feature you can look at is the leaf margin. Well, I'll show you. We'll, we'll come back to both these with sugar maple. So remember, sugar maple or red maple leaf margin is serrate and the sinus has an acute angle. The, the bud is blunt on red maple, as it is on silver maple. Uh, the other feature on red maple is it has these uh, platy bark, so the bark is formed like plates. They tend to be fairly small plates. When you get trees that are up to 12 inches in diameter, the bark starts to peel a little bit, and if you rub your hand on the bark, you'll get a sensation of like a pepper grinder, right? And the bark will flake away very prominently. And you'll feel it on your hand. It's not like Charmin toilet paper, but it's not, it's not like bristly locust either, but it's, you'll know it, but it, it'll, it'll flake away. Um, so this, I'm telling you this because it's gonna be contrast to what we see in sugar maple. So the big thing here, reddish buds, uh, coarse flaky bark, the fruit uh, develops and matures and disperses in the spring. Because of that, it's important for a lot of wildlife. Wild turkey, uh, in particular, I've heard um, favor the fruits uh, because it's a high protein source. You can make maple syrup, wonderfully good maple syrup from red maple. Don't think that you can't. The, the classic species is sugar maple, but if you're in an area, and some people in Ohio uh, make a lot of maple syrup um, from red maple trees. The difference is the buds, as the buds swell, there's a change in the chemistry of the sap. The hormones are being re probably produced and redistributed in the stem. And then those, um, those, uh, those hormones add a flavor to the, uh, to the sap that you concentrate when you boil it down into syrup and you give you what is called an off flavored syrup. Now, if you grew up on that off flavored syrup, you actually prefer that. So it's only off flavored relative to other syrups. But red maple makes a syrup, all the red maple syrup that I've had is indistinguishable from sugar maple syrup. All right, sugar maple, you're dying to know. What's the difference? The difference is sugar maple leaf margin is smooth or entire, E-N-T-I-R-E. -E. The margin is entire, meaning it's not serrate. Remember over here, the margin is serrate. The sinus is rounded versus the sinus is acute angle. So that's the key. And you can stand on a, on a uh, day when you can silhouette a leaf against the sky and you can see particularly the sinus is either rounded or an acute angle and you'll know red maple versus sugar maple. The buds, if all you have is a bud, bud is brown and sharp pointed on sugar maple. Remember, and I'll show you these in contrast, uh, versus red maple is red and blunt. Here we have 
brown, sharp pointed, sometimes with hairs, blunt, sometimes with hairs, Norway maple, much stouter twig. Notice how stout this twig is compared to the other twigs. Um, and then a very broad, blunt twig. The fruit, here I do them side by side because it's easier to describe them. Look at the um, margin of, uh, I'm trying to get my pen here. Look at this margin and this margin on sugar maple. When I talk about them being uh, parallel or slightly divergent, we're comparing those two sides. All right, so those, in this case that I just illustrated, those look um, slightly divergent. Sometimes they're almost perfectly parallel. Here we have these outside edges are in a uh, V shape on red maple. So red maple on the right, sugar maple on the left. Okay, here's the bark on sugar maple, a young sugar maple on the far right over here, smooth, uh, kind of grayish, brownish bark that becomes uh, platy. Uh, the plates on sugar maple will typically peel from the sides if they peel at all. Uh, and if you rub your hand over this, you'll just feel the roughness of the bark. You aren't going to feel, um, uh, you're, it's not going to flake away as you would with the sugar maple. So Tom says, which maple is best for collecting sap? Um, whichever maple you have on your property is the best one for collecting sap. Um, oh, there, Lou, Lou got me good. Sycamore maple, thank you. Acer pseudoplatinus. Uh, uh, I thought there is an, uh, oh, there's an Acer pseudoplatinus, you're right. Okay, I was thinking of platinus Acer folium. Okay, we'll come back to that, Lou. I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, forest tent caterpillar is a major pest on sugar maple. Acer sacarum, I didn't say what sugar maple was, Acer sacarum. Uh, it will attack red maple, though not with any great frequency. Um, uh, this is an old egg mass. You can see the, the pores are where the uh, caterpillar larvae have emerged. So this is an older egg mass. The difference in, in the, the egg mass of eastern tent caterpillar will look similar to this. Uh, forest tent caterpillar is egg mass is characterized by having a blunt edge. Uh, so you have a swollen section of the egg mass and then it drops ab abruptly and bluntly down to the twig versus the eastern tent caterpillar, which actually forms a tent. Forest tent caterpillar does not form a tent. Eastern tent caterpillar, the egg mass tapers down to the twig. Uh, very problematic in some areas. You'll get years of, of 80 to 100 percent defoliation. You can end up with some serious growth reductions in mortality. Best recognizable feature on sugar maple, sharp pointed bud, smooth leaf margin, rounded sinus, uh, parallel margins, outer margins of the Samara wings, and a tight, hard bark. Very shade tolerant, uh, very uh, preferentially browsed by deer. Okay, our final species is American beech. This is the most tolerant of shade of all of the eastern hardwoods. And you can see you've already done this, I'm sure. You've looked at it and you said, aha, this is an alternate leaved plant, and it is. It has a variable leaf margin. Um, I think of it as, as somewhere between, um, I don't remember the actual term, but it's kind of a wavy pattern, uh, so an undulation, und undulating margin. I'm sure there's a botanical term for that that I can't remember. Uh, all the way to a leaf margin that looks over here. If you just saw that particular leaf, you might think that that was an American chestnut. So it is in the same family, Fagaceae, a uh, different genus, Fagus for Fagus grandifolia, grand foliage, um, European beech, Fagus sylvatica. For those of you who have studied Latin, as I understand it, the, the end of the word is going to be the same because it denotes gender. Right, some of you know a lot more Latin than I do, so you can correct me. But so within a genus, so within a genus, you have Acer saccharum, Acer rubrum, Acer saccharinum, Acer nigrum. 
um, all have like endings. So when you have your tree quiz and you're trying to remember, is it grandifolia or grandifolium, and you can remember Fagus sylvatica, European beech sylvatica, you'll know that it's grandifolia, ending in A. So the foliage is green and waxy, uh, alternate, simple foliage. The buds are, for me, the, one of the easiest things to look at. It's uh, undis um, uh, quite unique in its brown, elongated, and sharp pointed imbricate bud scales, so overlapping bud scales, brown bud on a brown twig. The only thing that comes close to this is the bud, and it's not really close, but it has about the same shape, is uh, serviceberry, and the genus Amelanchor, also called Juneberry or Shadbush, has a shape of a bud that looks like this. It tends to have maybe some brown scales at the base, but then it has a red tinge to the margin of the scales uh, as you get towards the tip of the bud. Here's the fruit. Uh, here's the husk to the fruit. Here's the fruit is a three-sided nut or nutlet. There's a difference between a nut and a nutlet, and I don't know that difference. I should have looked that up. Maybe somebody can Google it for me. American beech bark. Uh, the healthy trees are beautiful. I grew up in Indiana, um, and, the, and the forests there would have some magnificent beech trees. Big, you know, 18, 20, 24-inch trees, towering monsters in the forest. Absolutely fabulous, stunning trees smooth gray bark until it gets infected with um, uh, beech bark disease. So beech bark disease starts with an insect, a beech scale that was an introduced species, it attacks it, and it, it makes the, the tree receptive to another introduced fungal species. Uh, Cryphonectria is the genus there, so that complex of insect and fungus, the, the insect does not vector the fungus, but it's a, it's a perfect host pathogen relationship um, because the, the fungus eventually kills the tree. Excuse me. But what's perfect about the host pathogen relationship is that the tree then sprouts from the root system and you have a genetically identical clone of the parent tree so that now is also susceptible to that same pattern of insect and fungus so you see over here in the understory I don't know why my pointers aren't disappearing but you see in the understory that um, the uh, beech, after, it's, after it uh, dies back or is cut back, can form a dense understory. Okay, best recognizable features for American beech, elongated sharp buds. That's a great uh, point. Smooth gray bark until beech bark disease arrives um, is another characteristic feature. Uh, there are some species, be careful. Uh, yellowwood, this is a genus Cladrastis. Um, I knew this from the Midwest, smooth gray bark, high value tree uh, compared to American beech, low value tree. Um, so if you have yellow wood, if you're from the Midwest, you have yellow wood, don't sell it as a beech tree because you'll lose money on it. Uh, the leaves are waxy, green, s uh, singly serrate, and um, alternate and simple. Very, very tolerant of shade very low deer browsing preference. So uh, you, the deer will, will go out of its way to eat something other than American beech. Uh, good mass crops in about a five to seven year cycle. Lots of things will eat, beech, will eat beech nuts, but if you only have a good seed crop every seven years, that's why diversity is important. So if your forest is becoming all beech because you know the turkey-like beech or deer-like beech, that's great, but you know, maybe six years out of seven, those deer or turkey or somewhere else where the food source is. So have a diversity in your woods. Very nice wood, um, lots of different uses. As I mentioned, can reproduce by seed, um, which is sexual reproduction or asexually by stump sprouts and root suckers. So as we close this, um, I hope you've got the sense that at least I think tree ID is fun. There's a lot of very cool things you can do with tree ID. Um, uh, 
you have to find the right field guide that works for you. There are probably a dozen different field guides that are available from very simple to very complicated. The complicated aren't necessarily the best ones. I would start with something simple. Find somebody that you can work with, a forester or a, in New York we have master forest owner volunteers. Some of them are pretty good with tree ID. Go on woods walks with your local forest owner association. Um, make a collection of twigs, a collection of fruits, practice them. Um, make flashcards, use all five senses. We talked about smell and taste and touch and sight. Um, we didn't talk about basswood, but if you knock on basswood, it has a hollow sound. So you can actually get all five senses in play with dendrology. Find a way to structure your learning, right? So we talked about alternate versus opposite, and then there are other things that you can layer on top of that that you'll see in the dichotomous keys. This is going to be a much better way to learn trees than just saying, okay, there are 200 different tree species in my state, and I'm going to memorize them individually. Um, that's going to be a lot of work. So find a way to break it down and structure your learning. And know that you'll accumulate knowledge through time. Uh, and as you learn one plant, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, other species in that same genus will be that much easier because you have something as a point of reference. So with that, I'm going to stop and going to open, if I do this correctly, the exit survey. Yep, there we are. There's the exit survey. So I'll encourage and I'm going to post the exit survey in the chat pod as well. And um, I do hope that you take a minute to fill out that exit survey. And uh, there's the link here. And um, it also asks some questions. So we had 61 people, I think, at our peak. Um, I want to thank Lou Ward. Lou's, uh, Lou doesn't live too far from here. We serve on the local NIFOA committee together. And Lou knows a lot about trees. Um, so I. Uh, maybe that's what it was, Platinus X acerifolia. Yep. So, any questions that you have? Any troubled trees that are coming to mind, or maybe you've heard something about a species or some ecological features of trees? Um, so, some of you can be thinking about questions and be taking the quiz. Not the quiz, that's not a quiz. <laughs> Don't think of that as a quiz. Think of this as an evaluation that will help me do my job better and better serve you. Questions? I'll see if I can remember some of the questions that we had at lunch. We had 152 people at lunch. That was a uh, good showing there. So some of the questions, one of the questions related to beech bark disease and whether uh, once you noticed the infestation, if by cutting the tree you would eliminate the source of infection. And uh, you aren't going to do that. Usually by the time you see the infestation, what you'd see first would be the insect. Uh, and even if you see the insect, uh, that doesn't mean there, there's 1% of the, of the clones of beech are reported to be resistant. Uh, it's important to say clone because you may look at an area of beech woods and there may be a dozen or more stems there, but they may all be of the same genetic makeup, remember, because they can grow uh, from the same root system. So 1% of the clones is different than 1% of the stems, but you may have, you may just have that 1% of a clone that may be infested by the insect but is resistant to the fungus. So I wouldn't be in any hurry to cut it. Um, if you have the insect, chances are you will, and the plant is, is uh, not resistant to the fungus, chances are you'll get the fungus uh, relatively soon. And once you get the fungus, you probably have two to five years, depending upon how quickly it spreads, before the tree will be dead. There is a, um, I think I showed, there was a, a link at the bottom of one of those pages. So if you saved this file, remember you do that, go to the File menu and uh, download the file as either a UCF or a PDF file format. There's a link to a fact sheet that I wrote with uh, Dr. Ralph Nyland from SUNY ESF. And he, uh, he and I give some, some, uh, some organic and um, chemical-based control methods to deal with, with B 
beech. Uh, beech can become quite a problem in our woods because it's tolerant of shade and because it is uh, not palatable to deer. There's silence in the airwaves. Well, if no one, oh. Okay, so Marty says, uh, one red maple on a property 15 inches DBH, which means diameter at breast height that peels like a hickory. Yes, so sometimes uh, red maple will will uh, peel away from the bottom and the top like a hickory, like a shagbark hickory will do. And um, they're often, the, the plates are usually different. Um, as, and as I recall, it's been a while since I've seen much silver maple of that size. Silver maple might be more likely to peel and have a shaggy bark that looks like a hickory. So it's possible. I mean, that, I'll uh, assume that it is a red maple. You can get some very significant shagginess to that bark. So, and someone's asking about uh, continuing education credits. That is an option. Um, let me bring that up and post the link. So here's the link for continuing education credits. If you didn't get it earlier, please do this today because when you enter the information, um, it's time stamped and what I do is I just pull the data for, in this case, January 16th and uh, I submit that. I have your entry information so I can cross validate it but I'm, I'm, uh, I use the timestamp so I don't have to sort back through um, months and months of data. So Herb asks if red maples are more prone to be multi-stemmed than sugar maples. Um, that's interesting that you would note. I have seen um, lots of old agricultural fields, and these are old in that they're 30 or 40 years or more since they've been in agricultural production, and every single red maple in those are multi-stemmed. They sprout usually at the base. Um, what I've always attributed that to, and I can't prove it, but what I've always attributed it to is that those uh, seeds became established at the tail end of grazing, and that the the seeds, the Maybe they had the cows out for a couple of years, and then the, you had a good red maple seed year. They seeded in and sprouted. The cows browsed them all back, and then the cows left. Um, something like that. So I don't. Other than that, I'm I can't answer that. Now, as sugar maple uh, in some areas tries to regenerate in the presence of deer, I'm seeing a lot of sugar maple that. I'll guess are going to have multiple stems because the deer browse the tops back and then you get multiple stems uh, coming along. So um, I, I, I attribute the multi-stemmed feature to be a function of, of herbivory after the seedling has become established. Uh, okay, so Joe's asking about climate change affecting these trees. There are, um, so there's, there's been a fair amount of work done by the Forest Service looking at predicting changes in the geographic distributions of trees based on um, different climate change models. And uh, the, the absence of seedlings associated with the two large black cherries might be due to shade. Um, it might be due um, so I guess it depends on where on those properties, where on that where on that property those cherries are located. If they're in a yard or in the woods, um, the, the younger the young black cherries have to have full sunlight. So if it's a closed canopy or partially closed canopy, the black cherry seedlings are not going to survive. That's probably not black cherry would be one that I would think would be least likely to have a response to any of the different. Um, uh, hypothesized climate patterns simply because black cherry has the greatest longitudinal um, distribution of any hardwood species. So it grows from, uh, I almost think it grows from 
Canada all the way down into Mexico. So I'll say that, you know, because of that, it's exposed to that full range of um, of climatic conditions of hot and dry and warm and wet and cool and wet and what have you. So I guess that of all species is going to be fairly robust. Um, Chris is asking about where to go. Warmer weather patterns affect trees negatively other than sugaring season. So the weather, the warmer weather pattern, uh, we, we had actually we had a pretty good cold snap in uh, early January, uh, at least in some parts of the of the Maple Range. Uh, we were up in at our property in the eastern Adirondacks, and we got down to at least minus three on one night. It was quite cold on several nights. That's enough uh, cold weather to for the trees to do what they need to do to produce good sugar. Um, uh, other than that, the the trees are in a state of dormancy. What would be problematic if we had enough warm weather? Um, that the, the, the tree started to break bud sooner, but most of those, a lot, some of that bud change is triggered not only by temperature, but also by photo period. So photo period is going to be very consistent. As I understand it, it's the most consistent environmental pattern that we have. Day length right, is very predictable. Key trees are keyed into that as a trigger. And so it's some combination of temperature and photo period that allows them to break bud. Um, so, uh, it, it would uh, the, the weather patterns that we've seen so far, I don't think, are going to have any um, profound effects on trees. They may have some effects on some fungi, maybe some insects, uh, but the, the trees themselves for the temperature patterns that we've seen so far, uh, I'm not anticipating any changes. Um, now, if we get if this if we get warm weather at the tail end of the season, uh, that's going to negatively affect sugaring. Herb says, I have some large, old ones. I assume red maples and woods for multi-stem and also some very old barbed wire. So barbed wire was attached to those at some point. Yes, I like shagmark hickory is a great tree because it is easy to identify. Although the hickories, if you noticed, there were no hickories in my um, in my presentation. Uh, there, there, there's some easy aspects to hickory, and there are some challenging aspects to hickory. So the the hickories, uh, when 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 a hickory is about three or four inches in diameter, uh, and particularly if it doesn't have leaves, um, I find it really difficult to separate out most of those hickories. There's one hickory, better not hickory, that has a bud that's very diagnostic, but the other ones are more challenging. So Tom points out that the predictions for pest infestation are, are projected to uh, become more problematic uh, under climate change scenarios. So David says, what's a good source of information for developing a small educational arboretum at a children's camp in which we have 20 species of hardwood trees in an area of six acres? Um, I guess I would get a um, <laughs> I would uh, one of my early references and, and remember um, if you go to the upper left hand corner, far upper left hand corner of your screen, the file menu well it won't work now, so let me let me put it back on the presentation. So here we go. So if you go to that file menu and uh, go to Save As and then Save As Document, you can save a copy of this and you get all of the web links. So the source for uh, developing an educational arboretum would be, I would start with, with one of those resource books, get the trees identified. Um, uh, I take some digital pictures at all seasons, and if you have a way to display those either indoor or undercover or laminated so that if you have a, a group of kids that are there in May, uh, May is an awful time to try to identify trees if, if, you're, if you're beginning because the buds have just broken, right? So the, the, you don't have the buds to look at, and the leaves are immature, so you don't have the leaves to look at. And uh, sometimes by May, the flowers are already gone, the fruit from the previous year have been eaten or covered up by last year's leaves. So 
you, you, you want to have some options, I think, if you could have a variety of different things on display um, for the students. You, you could have scavenger hunts. You could uh, have collections. You have a shoebox full of, of red oak acorns and another shoebox full of walnuts and another shoebox full of, of ash snares. Um, what I've done, when I, and I don't do very much with um, formally with youth education, but a really good strategy is just to have give them uh, two different twigs. Give them a maple twig and an elm twig, or an ash twig and a basswood twig, and have them describe what's different. And, and, and you get things like the color is different, but eventually you get to things like the shape of the leaf and the arrangement of the leaves and the texture of the leaf and some things that you can really um, draw out. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if that's very much help. So I would, I would get a good book on tree identification, identify those trees, um, have them, I would tag them with numbers, and then that way people could practice. Uh, and then you could have kind of a, a cheat sheet, if you will, that they could take out into the woods with them. Uh, I would also look at that Silvix manual, which was one of the earlier recommendations, because that will describe the life history characteristics of whether the tree is tolerant of the shade or intolerant of shade, what the primary pests are, how fast it grows. Um, and then another, uh, uh, I'll let folks do us, I don't know the web link, Woody. Seed Manual. If you do a search for Woody Seed Manual, uh, it's an online resource. It's a, it's a massive tome of, I don't know, four or five or six hundred pages, but it describes all of the seeds of every woody plant, I think, in North America. And it tells you how to germinate it. So if you need to have a cold period, how long the cold period is, if it needs to be cold cold and wet or cold and dry, um, how many how many seeds per pound or seeds per ounce and what have you. So, okay, so Tom says, where'd that go? The pine beetle, native species of the west have been destroying the forest because they're not killed in the mild winters. Many of your pests are doing uh, well because of mild temps. Yes, I've, um, the southern pine beetles come up into uh, southern New Jersey. Maple thrips, um, I know of maple thrips, I'm not, uh, I'm not really familiar with those. Mark wants to know which maple tends to hold its leaves into the winter. Hmm. Uh, Norway maple might. Is this, uh, I don't know if that's, some of the younger trees tend to hold their leaves irrespective of the species more so than older trees. But most of the maples I'm familiar with, uh, sugar and red and black tend to drop their leaves in the winter. So I don't know, maybe somebody else has some idea on that. Um, Chris Collins says, the bark can be used to bind things, uh, becomes like iron. That was, must have been a response to some comment. So, um, Warm late winter and spring allows buds to open too much and a hard frost of 18 to 20 uh, degrees Fahrenheit will kill flower buds of many species like oaks. And it's a good point. There are um, late spring frosts. We, we had a, a, a fabulous, this was I'll say three or four years ago, fabulous um, flowering of sugar maple. They had a hard frost and it killed the flowers or killed the flowers as they were developing into um, fruits. Okay, so Michelle says, what about CE credits? Um, let me put up that page. Is that it? No, nope. hang on. So that, here we go. So if you want CE credits, you can fill in your email and name and click on that. Okay, Brian says, I have one oak that's hard to identify. Um, so if you have trouble with your oaks, that's okay. Oaks can be a confusing bunch. Narrowed it down to swamp oak, possibly bur oak. Leaf science is very deep, and the leaves have to be coming out in many areas on the trunk. Uh, definitely oak, not a red. <laughs> wow. Brian, what I would recommend is that um, you go to this page. It'll open for me. This is uh, what we call the Cornell Forest Connect Ning site. So if you go to cornellforestconnect.ning.com, and I'll type that into the chat pod here. Um, 
actually, if you look down in the notes in the very bottom right hand corner, you'll see HTTP Cornell Forest Connect .ning. And then from here, you go to questions and resources. And then you go to woodlot management. And then you can ask a question. Um, you have to be signed in um, to be able to ask a question. You can ask a question. You can post a picture. So you can do that. Um, I can look at it there. Other people can look at it there. There are about 300 people that are uh, belong to this. It's a social media site. So I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, pictures. I can sit here and guess, and, and all it would be would be a guess. So. All right. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we've uh, run our time here. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And I uh, wish you all a great evening. And I'll see you next month. We'll talk about conifer tree identification. Wayne says, two sugar maples. Uh, so DBH, six feet apart. One has leaves in the spring for the other buds. And the fault's the first leaf lost. Huh. So there, there will be uh, genetic variation, um, Wayne, between when, when the species will um, will leaf out and, and as well as drop their leaves. It's interesting you have them so close together uh, and they have this very consistent pattern. So the next webinar is the third Wednesday of February, whatever that date is. All of these are on the third Wednesday. So thanks very much. Have a great night.